Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. We're in 2 Corinthians today, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We resume our study in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. The Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you're hungry for the Word of God, that's the place for you to go because you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation. Three complete series through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. I said if you're hungry for the Word of God, that's the place to go. If you're not hungry for the Word of God and you are professing to be a Christian, then you better go there. Or at least open up your Bible and start reading it because you need the Word of God more than anyone else. And I'll tell you, because it's not healthy and it's not normal for a Christian to not have a hunger for the Word of God. And the way you get a hunger for the Word of God is to be in the Word of God. That's why I suggest that you go there and begin a verse-by-verse study through the entire Bible. I'll explain it to you in a simple, concise manner. And the Holy Spirit will feed you because the Word of God is the most important thing on earth. And then you will have a hunger for the Word of God. The more you're in it, the more you'll love it. The closer you become to Jesus and the stronger your faith will grow. So I encourage you to study the Word of God at the Bible, verse by verse, dot com. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. In other words, Paul will not be quiet preaching. He will not be quiet. He will not be silenced from preaching Jesus and the Word of God in general, no matter how difficult it might become. He will not remain quiet. He will not stop proclaiming God's holy word because God is the one who told him to do it. He got his marching orders from Jesus, and he's not stopping. It doesn't matter who likes it or doesn't like it. That's not the issue as far as Paul is concerned. Jesus likes it. And we ought to do what God has called us to do because Jesus likes it. You say, yeah, but I'm not very popular. Who cares? You're supposed to be doing what God has called you to do because Jesus likes it. Not because somebody else might or might not like it. If they don't like it, that's their problem. If they do like it, thank God that you're able to bless somebody. But rather, that he is able to bless them through you. But the Bible says don't grow weary in well-doing. The Bible says don't faint in doing what is correct. And so that same divine mandate that Paul received will compel any called preacher of God's word. You can't remain quiet and you can't help but proclaim the pure truth of God's word the way God gave it. You can't. Not if God is calling you. Not if you're walking with the Lord. It's like Jeremiah tried to shut up. I can't do it anymore. I'm so sick of getting beatings and being persecuted for proclaiming the word of God. I, he says, I purposed in my heart I'm not going to say another word. Now that lasted about two seconds. He said, I couldn't help it. It was burning in my soul. I had to I had to speak it. See, same thing. Verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight 
of God. A very, very powerful verse, which is just loaded with wonderful truth. Paul did not twist the word of God. He did not water down the word of God. He spoke the truth clearly. When you live in the reality that God sees everything you do, like he did, you're going to want to do things the right way. Because if you don't, number one, when you live in the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ, and you don't have any unconfessed sins in your life, and you're doing things the way he wants you to do, there is joy that is beyond our ability to explain. Knowing that you're not alone, knowing that Jesus is with you, knowing that he has your back, that's worth more than anything else in the entire world. So when you do something that is sinful, or if you're a preacher and you don't proclaim the clear word of God the way you should, if you're saved and if you're truly called, you're going to feel cut off from God, and you are. Your fellowship with God is not there. And that is like a little child lost in a department store by himself looking for mom and dad. When you live in the presence of Almighty God, and you understand that he sees everything that you do. You're going to want to do things the right way. I don't have the guts to not speak the truth. I don't have the guts to not proclaim the word of God as clearly as I can. I don't have the guts not to do it. I've had people say that I was bold. I don't think of myself as bold. I think of myself as being a coward. I fear God. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them who are lost. A very strong statement from God here. If the word of God concerning salvation through Jesus Christ is explained to someone but they just don't get it they don't get it because they are on the way to hell they don't get it because they are spiritually dead and spiritually lost and as of right now doomed and damned When I tell you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who lived a sinless life, who then died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ by receiving him as Lord and Savior, and you scratch your head and say, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't buy it. You're on your way to hell. You die right now. You'll go straight to hell and you'll burn there forever, paying for your sins. Because your heart is not open to truth. There's some sin in your life that you don't want to give up. It might be the sin of pride, working your way to heaven. It might be some other sin. You don't want to give it up. You don't want to repent. And that's what he's saying. Look. I'm not, I'm not making this up, okay? This isn't the word of Moret. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, if you don't get it, if it doesn't make sense to you, it is hid to those who are lost. Lost because you will not accept the message of the cross that Jesus died to pay for your sin. You reject that, you're dead dead forever in the lake of fire, burning, suffering, tormented. 
It's coming. It is coming. As sure as winter follows fall, it is coming. And you will never forget this that I am telling you today. For all the centuries, the millennium that you burn in hell nonstop, you will remember this day when I told you the truth and you rejected it. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world, that refers to Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. And that's a willful blindness. It's not that Satan forces you not to see, man. He's, he's the agent, but you give him permission by your willful blindness because you love some sin in your life that you don't want to repent of. And you know deep down in your heart that if you want to be saved and you want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, you want to be forgiven, you got to repent. Lots of people out there who explain away the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, explain away the reality of Christ and Almighty God and heaven and hell because they don't want to repent of a sin. And they know they're going there, whether they admit it or not. So in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil blinds the spiritual eyes of those who don't believe the word of God. It is the person's fault for not believing the word of God. Because you can. The word of God is Holy Spirit anointed. It has God's power pulsating inside of it. Anyone can believe it. Those who do not choose not to. And it's a reflection on the rebellious attitude toward God. It's not an intellectual thing. It's not a mental thing. When you reject the word of God, specifically talking here, the salvation message through Jesus Christ, that is a spiritual issue. You have a corrupt heart. Your eyes are willfully blind. You don't want to see it. You don't like it. It's the person's fault for not believing the word of God. That's the first thing to understand. And then the devil takes quick, quick advantage of that hard heart by rushing in and blinding the eyes. But you already blinded your own eyes, see? You can't blame the devil. You see, the word of God is the word of God. If one doesn't believe the word of God, they reveal that they have a deep spiritual problem, a hard heart concerning God. You think the Bible is on trial? The Bible is not on trial. People are. I'm going to test to see if the Bible is the word of God. You arrogant pathetic, sinful human being. You're not going to test the, you're not going to put the word of God on trial. You're the one who is on trial. The word of God is truth. It is the word of God. The Bible is not on trial. People are. And a person's attitude towards scripture reveals if they are innocent or guilty, whether they have a heart for God or not. You're the one on trial. The Bible is what the Bible is. It's truth. God is not a man that he should lie. It's the yardstick, not you. You either measure up or you don't. But the word of God, the yardstick's not changing. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. Paul didn't preach his own philosophies. 
his own ideas. He certainly didn't preach to draw attention to himself, to get people to think that he was someone special with a lot of talent. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and what he did on the cross, dying for our sins, of course, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. A good preacher doesn't preach about himself or talk about himself. He talks about Jesus and no one else. He talks about Jesus and not the mother of Jesus, and not the saints of Jesus. That's not where his foot. I'm not saying you can never mention these things. I'm not saying you can never mention yourself. I'm, I'm not saying that. But the focus is not on self. The focus is not on Jesus' mother. The focus is not on the saints. Jesus is Lord in church, in sermons. Jesus must be talked about. In church, Jesus must be the focus. He should be the focus of your life constantly, and he is. If you're a Christian who's saved and filled with the Spirit of God, Jesus is your focus constantly. That's what you, that's what's, if it's not in the fore, if he's not in the forefront of your mind, he's right there. Verse 6, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. The God who said, let there be light, and there was light. That same God gives us spiritual light to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and also the, the ability to understand the Bible as a whole. And when you receive Christ as Lord and Savior, I think I mentioned this the last broadcast, the Holy Spirit, the author of the book, comes and lives inside of you. You got the author. That's why when you open up the book after you're saved, it makes sense. Things start jumping out off the page at you. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The power to understand Jesus and the word of God doesn't come from us. It comes from God. We can't take credit for any spiritual understanding that we might have. If you get anything out of these messages, it's only because the Holy Spirit takes his word and illuminates it to you. If I get in, when I study the word of God, anything I get out of the word of God is not because of me. It's because of the Holy Spirit who is in me. And if you get anything out of these messages or when you're reading the Word of God on your own, it's because of the Holy Spirit. That's the only reason. He's the teacher. Verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. You know why? Because they were confident of the ultimate victory. You know, if things go wrong in a football game, but you already know the final score... Like, say you're watching a tape-delayed football game, like I used to back in the day, back in the 60s, early 70s, the Packer games, the preseason games were blacked out sometimes. So I would, I would hear the score, and then it was replayed the, de the, the next day. Well, things, got, things went wrong. Packers make mistakes. It didn't bother me if I knew the final score and that they won. Yeah. Big deal. You don't get all shook up about that. And that's what it was with Paul, too. Didn't, yeah, things went wrong. But he knew the final score. There was trouble on every side. Lots of trouble. Lots of problems. Yet not distressed. Because he knew that the end would be 
victory, victory for him, victorious in the end. See, I know it's not fun going through stressful times. I know there are many, many things that contribute to our sadness. Even those of us who love Jesus, it really gets hard sometimes. I understand that. And I know I'm talking to a lot of people right now. I know that there's such a wide range of terrible things that you're enduring. But, but please try to have the attitude of the Apostle Paul who, yeah, troubled, but never distressed because he knew in the end everything would be wonderful. See? And that's even, you know, that's the way Jesus was. For the joy that was set for before him, the Bible says, he endured the cross and despised the shame because he was looking at the other end, beyond the suffering, to the victory. That's going to be yours and mine. See? This is just temporary. Just hang in there with Jesus. Draw closer to Jesus in your times of distress, in your times of trouble. And he'll give you the grace to make it through. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Never, never utterly at a loss where it's all over. You know, that sort of thing. So he's talking about having a lot of trouble. There's a lot of trouble, but never destroyed. And that's because Jesus is in control. And Jesus has the keys to death. And no Christian ever dies unless Jesus unlocks that door. We can get in all sorts of hot water as Christians. And sometimes we don't understand why things are the way they are. Sometimes we don't understand the what and the why of everything. What's going on and why is it happening? But we don't have to lose hope. We can always hang on tight to the changeless word of Almighty God. Hang on to it with white knuckles. Cling to it and don't let go. He continues, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed, suffering for saying what the Word of God says without apology, suffering for saying what we believe when we believe the Word of God and living what we believe doesn't mean that God has left us that kind of suffering doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. God never leaves us, and he never stops loving us. It just means that you just happen to be living in a world that hates truth and hates righteousness for the most part. And it's not too crazy about you if that's what you proclaim and that's how you live. Oh, when it benefits them, sure. Sure. But if it makes them feel guilty, which it often does, then watch out. You better duck because the missiles are coming right at your head. So verse 10, always bearing about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. If a Christian wants to be used by God, in sharing eternal life through Jesus Christ to lost sinners, then they must be willing to suffer and even face death for their faith, just like Jesus suffered and died. Because I can tell you this, if you're a lukewarm Christian who bails out, who is so worldly that, that anybody can barely tell that you're a Christian, I mean, they got to really search hard. They got to examine you with a microscope to see if there's any spiritual fruit there. You might as well forget it. God doesn't use that type of a human being. He doesn't use that type of a 
so-called Christian. The holier you are, the more you live for Jesus, the more trouble you're going to get in, but the more he's going to use you. Verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh to get the message of eternal life to the unsaved. A Christian has to be willing to sacrifice if need be. If we're not willing to get out of our comfort zone as Christians, trust God instead of the world. Trust God instead of money. Trust God instead of the government. Trust God instead of man. If we're not willing to get out of our comfort zone and put our complete and total trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not willing to do that, we are going to be a poor instrument of eternal life to lost, hell-bound sinners if we're going to be instruments at all. Pretty much useless. Verse 12. So then death works in us, but life in you. The threat of death to God's faithful people is the road of life to those who repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Verse 14, actually verse 13. We having the same Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, we having the same Spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore I have spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. If you really believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins and that salvation is only through him, then you will want to help get that message out to others. If you don't want to, then I don't see any evidence that you're saved. It is unthinkable that one would have the the words of eternal life, know it, but not share it with others. It is unthinkable. It's unbelievable. If you have the Holy Spirit in you that wants souls to be saved so badly, you're going to do it. You're going to help get out the word of God. Maybe you can't preach, but you're going to support those who do. Verse 14, knowing that he, God the Father, which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Boy, that's something to look forward to, isn't it? Christians can afford to sacrifice this life and service of Jesus Christ because God has promised to raise us from the dead like he raised his son, and things are going to be better than ever. So why are you clinging to the things of this world for? Don't let the world, the flesh, or the devil stop you from going all out for Jesus. Don't let materialism, fear, stop you from going all out for Jesus. 15. For all things are, your, are for your sake, that the abundance of grace might through, might through the thanksgiving of many re, redound to the glory of God. What Jesus did on the cross is going to result in millions of people being saved from hell. And that wonderful act of love by God will result in him being honored too and praised forever and ever with all these saved souls. We'll never be able to thank him sufficiently. We'll just keep doing it all forever and ever. We'll never stop. 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. God gave them strength to persevere in getting out the message of Jesus. They sacrificed and they suffered, but God was with them, and that made all the difference in the world. Verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory Compared to the wonderful eternity we will have as Christians, even the worst, even the most trying situations in life are absolutely nothing. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If you can see it, 
then it's temporary. No, and no matter what it is, it's temporary, and it's not going to last. If you can see it, it's temporary, it's not going to last. It might be something enjoyable. It might be something painful. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's only temporary. So keep your thoughts on Jesus and keep your thoughts on eternity. That's the best thing to do. That's the most important thing to do. Don't lose that Jesus focus. Don't lose that eternal focus. Pay no mind to the things of this world, whether they be good or bad. If they're good, enjoy them. If they're bad, just remember, it's temporary. Hang in there with Jesus. You can continue studying the Word of God right now if you want. I have to stop. But you can continue at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please remember that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. Never been underwritten by a large church or denomination or foundation or anything like that. It's just been, it's just been me getting out the Word of God for over 30 years, verse by verse, as clearly as I can, and trusting that God will move people who love His Word and appreciate it to give to support this ministry. And you can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com by clicking on the donate button at the top of the front page and giving as the Lord may lead. Otherwise, you can write scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, zip 53074. That's scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. Out of time. Appreciate you folks. Thank you for spending this time with me. It means an awful lot. Until next time. Mike Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.